We're going to actually look at a lesson uh, seven, which is entitled Honestly Speaking. So it's sort of like let that words that come out of your mouth be truthful. And I, you know, I distinctly remember a few years back, a guy said to me, he never lies. And that was probably, yeah, probably not a lot of truth in that statement. I think we all sort of fudge on the truth, right? A little bit here and there. So if somebody will read, read Proverbs 19, chapter verse 1, I'd appreciate it. Um, better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. Okay. And 28.6, what he believes is some sort of our bounce off that this morning. Yes, please. Better is the poor that walketh in his uprightness than he that is perverse in his ways, though he be rich. So, you know, we get the idea here from Proverbs, and there's, there's a gazillion more scriptures associated, associated with this whole idea of integrity, that it's, it's far better for your word to be true as opposed to have a false word. And, and have a lot of different things going on as far as riches and stuff. So uh, let's talk about something um, and, and just try to figure out uh, just a random little thing here this morning. Uh, and I want to read, if someone will look up uh, Proverbs, excuse me, Proverbs, but Psalms, the 26th chapter, verses 1 through 3. I want to talk uh, exclusively about that this morning. That was the last verse or verses in the lesson. It's a prayer of David. You got to go ahead. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord. Therefore, I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart, for thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. Okay, what are some of the things we know about David? I mean, he's one of the most celebrated kings in, in, in the Old Testament. What are some things that you use? How does the Bible describe David? After God's heart. After God's heart, okay. Obviously, he's talking here about himself, and then he's asking the Lord to look at him, to to make an assessment of him and and uh, what do you think about when you when you hear this prayer so you got the new king james go ahead and read that one aloud to sort of get a little mixture here of, of the different translations it was one through three yes <laughs> vindicate me O lord for i have walked in my integrity i have also trusted in the lord i shall not slip examine me O lord and prove me try my mind and my heart for your loving kindness is before my eyes and i have walked in your truth See, poetry, and this is a poetic book, in, in Hebrew poetry, you know, he does these comparing and contrast. And so when he says, the Lord vindicate me, he says, because I've walked in my own integrity. What he's saying there essentially is this. He's saying that I'm walking the way that I walk, but that's not good enough. You know, he's really being honest with himself. And so... I think what we've got to sort of understand, at least for myself and maybe for you as well, honesty starts with ourself first, and then it goes to God. You know, God God knows everything there is about us. Uh, I was asked to rewrite the prayer in, in the lesson that, that I went through here on the book, and so let me read you what I rewrote about this prayer. Father, make me a person of character because my actions will never be good enough. My trust is in you, and you will not fail. Work in me and make me more like you. I can easily see you love me as I walk with you. You know, I think that really, I don't know, that's, to me, it captured what, what David, in my words, is trying to say there. He's just basically saying that, Father, I know I'm not good enough. I need you to, to, to make me good enough. Because I'll never be good enough. And I'm going to trust that you're going to make me good enough. Because you never fail at anything that you attempt. And 
the more that I walk with you, the more that I work with you, the more that I can see you in my life. So what is it about lies? Why do we lie? Why, why is it that we just make things up? Sometimes it's we make things up so it would seem like we're uh, a little more than what we are, right? Uh, sometimes it's we don't want to be accountable for things. So they, they do a neat little question here. So let me ask you this question. And I think it's worthwhile to take some time with this question. Uh, why are the vowels in the word good and food pronounced differently? Good is spelled G-O-D-D, -D, right? And food is spelled F-O-D-D. -D. Why are those two vowels different? Now, I don't want you to answer it. But I'm going to give you a think about that. And I'm going to make three statements. Two of these statements are true. One of them is false. And what I want you to do is figure out which two are true, which one is false. So we're going to take a stab at this. That has to do with origin from the English language. That's the differentiation and the pronunciation of the two different O's. It has to do with the difference between the long and the short double O. And in the English, there are eight ways to pronounce double O. So two of those things are true. One of those things are Now, you were ready to jump in there. Which two are true? Which one's false? No, I just want to let you know you spelled fuck food as F O D. Yes, F O D. You did gave it a double D. A five. A five. I have no idea. F O D. F O F O D. Sorry. F O D. F O D. I didn't have I didn't have spell check on it. So, which one is the truth? Which two are the truth? Its origin has to do with its origin from the English language. It has to do with the difference between long and short O's, double O's. And in English, there are eight different ways to pronounce double O's. Let's say one and three are true. Let's say one okay. and two are true. Which one? One and two. One and two are true. Anybody else want to take a stab? Brenda? I'm still trying to figure out how to spell food. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be a long flight. How about it, Jay? You're our English lit guy over there. I have no idea. We came down. Oh, you came in late. Yeah. Why do we say good food excuse. or good? Oh, 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 in both cases, but we say it differently. Because the English language is different. The English language is different. <laughs> <laughs> Those two here, words. Are three, here are the three, three, here's three answers to that question. Two are true, one is false. It has to do with the origin, its origin in the English language, good or food, where it came from. Second one is it all has to do with between the long and the short pronunciation of double O. And in English, there are eight different ways to pronounce Three. That's what your dad said. Okay. You said one and two. Anybody else want to take a stab? Gotta go down with the blood. I know one and three too. <laughs> What'd you say, Jake? Thank you, Jake. It's about time. <laughs> well, the truth is, you two are right. It's one and two. Okay. As soon as Jake agreed, I knew it was cool. <laughs> now, who made those statements? I did, right? And some of you know some things about me, and some of you don't know very much about me, right? At all. And so which is more difficult, knowing me, and I might be a person of integrity that probably is going to state something true, or would I mislead you? Which is more difficult to try to figure out, right? Of the statements because they all sound relatively true. Actually, eight, uh, it's not eight ways to pronounce it, there's six different ways to pronounce double O in the English language. I didn't know that either until I looked it up. So it good to me. It all sounds the same. So what, what's more difficult, knowing me or knowing that I made a lie up in that statement. That's what I'm trying to say. 
Do you want to sort of give me a little hedgeway because you know me? Right? Yeah, I want to hold you more accountable. More accountable? Because I know you. Let me ask you this. How difficult the last time you told a lie? How difficult was it to lie? I'm going to have to answer that. <laughs> how difficult was it for you to lie? How did you make it into a believable lie? By creating more lies. You might create more lies, right? Well, let me ask this, which we can talk about this one. Why do people lie? Why is that? Sometimes you do it so you don't hurt the other person's feelings. I think a lot of times we do whatever is the flesh is always easy to do. The spirit's always hard to do, right? So the things of God are always the hard way, the narrow way. It's easy to eat a lot. It's easy to drink a lot. It's easy to lie a lot because those things are natural to us. Those things are easy to do. And it's easy to lie. It's easy to try to sometimes paint a picture of yourself in your own mind or before God or others because it's that's what's the flesh. It's easy to do. That's That comes natural. It's not of God. So, that's my opinion on why I guess I'm a good at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, it's easy to look at a child and sort of ascertain that, you know, they may not be really giving us the truth, right? If you quit listening next with your daughters yet, have they sort of budged on some things? Here and there. Okay. Yeah. Self-preservation. She did this to me, or we're just wearing this. Yeah. I think one reason is pride. Yeah. You know, to basically <clears throat> make yourself look better in certain situations. I remember one of the worst times I ever caught got caught lying. I was about seven years old, and uh, it was uh, my grandmother walked up to uh, Corian Avenue, we lived in the Grosbeck area, and there was an old store, uh, some of the older people may remember, Western Auto. Anybody remember Western Auto? Uh, nobody remembers Western Auto, that's right. Well, it was, just, it was sort of like a hardware store, okay? Auto parts, and they sold everything, anything in the catalog. Uh, but there was a Western Auto store on Corian Avenue, and I went in there with my grandmother, and there were some batteries. Now, I didn't need any batteries, but as a seven-year-old kid, I wanted those batteries, okay? And so I picked the batteries up, and she said, you don't need those batteries. And I said, well, hey, I, I want those batteries. I'd like to have those batteries. She said, but you don't need those batteries. Put them back. And so uh, I acted like I put them back, but then I went and snuck around, and I put them in her purse, okay? Uh, what I did. So we walked home, it was about a three quarter mile walk to, from the house, from Corrin Avenue, where we were at. She so got home, she started throwing through her purse to get something out, and there were those batteries. And uh, she asked me, you know, how did they get there? I don't know. Well, my dad knew better. He said, you know, we know how they got there. Now we're going to take them back. And uh, that was a pretty bad feeling. But I sort of figured out right then that uh, sometimes for, for Mark Wilson, truth is uh, a rare commodity. You know, you mentioned self-preservation. Someone did, right? Sort of try to protect yourself, make yourself in a, in a, a, good, a good life. You know, you don't want to be thought less of. I don't know if anybody else wants to share time. You know, maybe when you were a kid you got caught got caught with the hand in the cookie jar kind of thing, you know, how, how did that make you feel? You know, what, what did it, what feelings did it evoke? I mean, I know I was devastated. I didn't want to go back up there. I was, no, I'm not going. Yeah, you are. You're going to march right back up there and you're going to give that guy the batteries. It makes you embarrassed. I can stand there and tell somebody what you did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, 
we can learn a lot from the Bible because it is the book of books. It is the Gion Gibeon, which is the Greek for uh, holy book, right? The holy book. And uh, it has a lot to say. Uh, it really gets down to the brass, bare knuckles of who we really are. And, and we're all just a hot mess. We're all a hot, broken mess to be really clear about it. Proverbs 11, chapter, verse 20 says, Those with twisted minds are detestable to the Lord, but those with blameless conduct are his delight. Notice that the Bible is very careful in its speaking about herself. You'll see terms like blameless or perfect. It doesn't mean that we're not without sin. It doesn't mean that we're not without our faults, our, our failures, but it means that we have learned from our faults, from our failures. We've learned to follow him. Just like David, when David cried out to God, said, you know, God, uh, you know, I, I've walked in my integrity. I need you to make me right because I know I'm not going to measure up. And when we really get a, a hand, a handle on who we are and just how broken we are, we can really understand, really, the gospel is the only thing that brings us to a place where we're worthy. And it's not that we make ourselves worthy. It's, it's what he does for us. He makes us worthy. Uh, Proverbs, the 12th chapter, verse 22, lying lips are detestable to the Lord, but faithful people are his delight. We get that contrast. This is bad. This is good. Uh, it goes on to say in Proverbs, the 13th chapter, verse 6, righteousness guards people of integrity, but wickedness undermines the sinner. A truthful witness rescues lives, but one who utters lies are deceitful. I think what you said earlier about, you know, you tell one lie, you've got to utter something else to come up with it. Does anybody, has anybody ever watch that movie, Liar, Liar? Remember that movie? That was so, so hilarious. You know, Jim Carrey is just such a sight gag comedian, but he just could not for anything lie. And he, him being a lawyer, he lied all his life, you know, lied about everything. And, and uh, you know, he just physically was just so hurtful to try to tell the truth. But he came to the place after telling the truth enough, I guess the moral of the movie is this, he wanted to tell the truth after that, after not being forced to tell the truth. Better a poor man who walks in integrity than someone who has deceitful lips and a fool. So let's let's focus on this for a, a little while this morning, while we still have about a few minutes here. Let's talk about different types of dishonesty this morning. Different types. What else does God detest besides just dishonesty? What do we know that just really just sets him to edge in the actions that we do? Where you said pride, I think God hates pride. Where you said something else, I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's not good. Uh, I just said greed. Greed, right? And you know, isn't it amazing when we think about it? Everything that God hates is bad for us, right? It's not like He something's good for us and He says, "Hey, I hate that because it's good for you." He hates the things that are bad for us. We talk about pride. Pride is Will, will devastate your life. It, it will color a world of just unbelievable heartache and sorrow because you're not willing to admit that you either don't measure up, or you're just not good enough, or you're not smart enough, or you need help. That's kind of life that pride paints. What about greed? Well, if you look at what it says in Timothy, it says, for the love of of money is the root of all evil. The, the grammar in there, the Greek grammar, really says this. It says, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And it doesn't matter what you're talking about, whenever it, it, money is involved and it's evil, you know, that's the love of it. The, the root of it is the love of money. Anywhere where there is uh, greed, there's always evil attached to it. 
doesn't say money in itself is evil. It's not. It's, it's a tool. It's just something that we have. We are given account for how we utilize it. And do, we, do we bless others with it? Do we, do we rise and smart stewards with it? Are we just greedy, hoarding to ourselves kind of folks? But, you know, when God says greed's not good, you know, we ought to take that to heart because it really is bad for us. What's another type of uh, dishonesty that God uh, affords? Somebody else want to take a stab? Devising wicked plans. Devising wicked plans, right? What about uh, speaking, uh, uh, gossiping? You know, speaking ill of someone. All those things uh, God's not really happy with. And those are things that come right out of our mouth. What did Jesus say? It's not what goes into a man that defiles a man. What is it that defiles a man? Things that come out. Right? That's right. Things that come out of his mouth. Because they proceed about what? Of the heart. According to Proverbs 12.22, it tells us that somebody look that up and let's read that. I want, I want to read that out loud. The Lord detests lying lips, but he delights in men who are truthful. It's funny when when how do you feel when someone lies to you? Not good. Not good? Or take it personal, right? Especially if it's a spouse or a child, we take it personal. Well, just imagine this: when we lie, you know, how does God feel about it? Do you think He might take it a tad bit personal? Proverbs twenty, verse seventeen says this: "For food gained by fraud is sweet to a man, but afterward his mouth is full of gravel." I love that description. So it's stealing. So how does stolen food taste? Like gravel. Why is it that description given? Cheating. How is wealth obtained by fraud like a vanishing mist? It says in Proverbs 21 6, it says, Make a fortune through a lying tongue is a vanishing mist, a pursuit of death. Cheating. Ill gotten goods. Slander, which we've already sort of talked a little bit about, bearing false witness, that kind of thing. So, here's a way to sort of evaluate yourself uh, this morning. Uh, let's ask ourselves honestly. Where are you living right now? Where are you right now when it comes to integrity, to honesty? Uh, is honesty very important to you? Or, uh, and I admit that I color the truth to suit myself. Creative truth, I've heard it called creative truth, though I'm basically honest. I'm sort of benefit from dishonesty, so you know, I, I, I it's turned, it's helped me out in my life. Uh, I, I'm usually honest, but sometimes I can tell a huge lie, especially if it helps me to get at what I want or what I deserve. Or you know, I'm just cheating, lying, thieving, stealing right now. There's a way to evaluate. I checked one here. I said, honesty is very important to me. And I don't measure up where I need to measure up at. Because I'll never be Christ-like completely in this life. But honesty is something that is of great importance to me. Because I, again, I know when God tells me that greed's bad, that's a good thing for me to take to heart. When he tells me lying's bad, it's a good thing for me to take to heart. So let's, let's ask ourselves if we were going to complete this sentence. Dishonesty is serious sin because. How would you complete that sentence? Because it destroys. It destroys? Yeah. Somebody else. Dishonesty is bad because. You're hurting yourself. Hurting yourself. Good. Very good. Just 
displeases God. Displeases God? It can hurt your relationship with God, too, if you feel shame and you don't want to go to Him and talk to Him and turn away because of that. It can cause that, too. There's something, something I learned a long time ago, and it, it's, it's been a really helpful thing for me in my, my walk with Christ is uh, try to put myself aside, try to put others aside, and try to put him first. You know, in some circles they call it the playing, playing to an audience of one, because ultimately we're playing to an audience some way, somewhere. You know? We're either playing to a group of people trying to make them happy, and we'll tell them things to make them happy, and we'll fudge on the truth to make them happy, Art, we're playing to this audience called me, myself, and I, which I will say anything to make me, myself, and I feel like the, the king of the world. And so if I have to renege or fudge or, or be creative with the truth, I will do that. But when I ultimately figured out that there's only one person that I have to please, it's not my wife, it's not my kids, it's not the church that I pastor or the friends that I have. I have one audience, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I figure out that I answer to him, and what do I need to do to make him happy, then all the other things typically, if not always, fall into place. They fall into a far better place, right? Just a happier, more sounder place. Doesn't mean someone doesn't like when they say, hey, Pastor Mark, uh, what about this? They say, well, we thought about this, but we're doing this because of this. In, in, in a few days, in, in one day at the church I pastor at, I was the son of Beelzebub and the greatest thing that ever happened in, in one person's life, one day, you know, just bam, either the worst person ever or, you know, the greatest person in the whole wide world. I didn't take either one to heart because I'm there to make God happy. And you talk about when people have an agenda, you know, if somebody's got an agenda in your life, when you... <laughs> When they see that you, it's not that you don't love them, it's not that you don't care about them, it's not that you want, not that you're not working hard or anything like that, but your concern focuses on God above and beyond anybody else, it just sort of shuts it all down, folks. I mean, it really does. It's, it's been a game changer for my life. So how can God help any of us become a more honest person. Hear his voice. Hear him. Right. This is a very careful question, too. How difficult is it for you to recognize dishonesty in someone else. Well, it's easy to always to see someone else, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Never look in the mirror. That's right. Yeah. We behold the speck in someone else's eye and we never see the tree. You know, that image where Jesus talks about law is literally in the grammar, the Greek grammar is suggesting a tree growing out of your eye. That's the grammar there. And it's almost like a cartoon characterization of what you know, being critical of others can do to you. It makes you cartoonish. You know, you, you look look crazy. You know, somebody's got something that can barely be seen, but here you are assessing them, and you've got this giant, unbelievable thing that no one can miss. But I do think there is viability, nonetheless. I'm not saying that we should never judge others, but there does need to be careful assessment of what others are telling us, right? We do need to be uh, at least somewhat remotely concerned when someone tells us that uh, we just won the lottery, right? And we didn't buy a ticket. Uh, we do need to be concerned about that, all right? Well, uh, let me ask a couple other questions here as well. Uh, 
here's some do's actually we'll talk about the do's. Here's some things that I think can be a great benefit for everyone here today as we wind it up in the last few minutes here. Realize that God takes honesty very seriously. And so, you know, sometimes we will fudge on the truth, we'll fudge on our taxes, you know, we'll just do different things. We'll, we'll skimp with the waitress at, at, the, at the restaurant, which is, you know, and they're working hard, don't do that, and then leave tracks. That's, that's not a good thing to do, you know. Take on, God takes honesty seriously, and we should have that in the front of our mind. We need to focus on the truth. Um, sometimes we're tempered to, tempted to tamper with the truth, but don't. Keep the truth the truth. And, uh, and ultimately recognize that there are advantages to being honest. Godly, eternal, uh, uh, godly eternal advantages for being honest. Uh, anybody with anything to add or throw out to that? I want to thank you for, for listening to me. Thank you. I haven't taught a class like this in a while. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Hope it was helpful. Yes, thank you, Mark. Let's have a word for Father, we come before you grateful for this opportunity and thank you for this time. Uh, we do pray for the service this morning as we uh, worship together. Pray for Ali and use her mightily in, in your name and for PJ as he presents uh, your word today. Looking forward to hearing from your word from him. And we ask for your blessings. Draw people to the cross. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.